ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, I'm here to introduce you to the two speakers for this evening, Eliana Saita and Smyrna McCarthy. The latter is from Iceland and uh, founder or co-founder of the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. It's now the International Modern well, Media Initiative. Okay. And uh, Ella is from the internet and also an activist. And uh, well, the floor is you, <laughs> Madam Sir. So we're here today to uh, talk to you about network politics and what exactly network politics are and why the future looks like that and why that's maybe not such as, maybe we're not in such a bad position as we thought we were. Um, so we're in a really interesting moment right now where a lot of stuff is changing. We've got this kind of cool, interesting new structures that are showing up on the scene, but um, they're coming into being at a really dangerous moment and a really um, pivotal moment for the future of humanity. Um, the existing structures that we've been depending on to keep us safe, things like the conventional nation state, representative democracy, um, existing infrastructure are failing at an increasing rate. Um, we don't really want to live in a future where all of the infrastructure that we depend on to live is broken, but that's sort of the future that we're facing right now. Um, you know, we need a different way of organizing, a different structure that can actually bring us out of that. But the, the good news is that uh, due to the internet, which we all love, has, uh, uh, it, we've actually learned a lot of really interesting methods of uh, collective organization that, although maybe from a strict point of view they were possible 200, 300 years ago, uh, the access to information, the speed at which things happen have uh, quite potently over the last couple of years shown us that we know what we're doing when, when it comes to getting people together. So. There are some problems with network politics, though. Um, so if you look at systems like the liquid democracy system that the pirates are using in Germany and elsewhere, um, it does a lot of things very well. However, it, it has a few trade-offs that it's decided to make. Um, the liquid democracy system, in case anyone here is, uh, show of hands, who's familiar with, with liquid democracy? Oh, good. Okay, so it's about, it's about half. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. Liquid democracy is a delegated voting system where instead of voting in a representative, everyone votes on every issue. Now, to keep this from taking up everyone, all of everyone's free time, instead, you can delegate someone to say, oh, you know, I trust this guy's opinion on, say, medicine. I trust this guy's opinion on, um, you know, legal issues. I trust her opinion on... Um, you know, the, the, the power system. And you can delegate your votes to those people. Now, if at any point they, take, they make a decision that you don't like, they can pull that vote back. Um, and, you know, you can, everybody, anybody can propose uh, a potential new legislation. There's lots of different checks and balances to make this work, so you can't just spam the system. The problem is that one of the things, or one of the problems, is that one of the things that is required, given that this is a mostly electronic system, in the current implementation, all of the votes have to be public. This brings up a really unfortunate trade-off. The system, as it stands, does not allow people with minority opinions to express those opinions on a politically important issue. Now, right now, this doesn't really matter too much because the pirates aren't doing anything which has real serious individual political consequences of an immediate nature for the people who are voting. But if you think about, say, um, trying to pass gay rights legislation in Uganda right now using something like liquid democracy, if you are the person who proposes that legislation, or you're even just a person who votes for it, then maybe you get an angry mob showing up outside of your house and they want to, and they want to kill you. That's not so great. Um, the problem is that the reason why they use public votes, the reason why all of this happens in the open is because in an electronic voting system, they don't have another way of verifying that the system isn't being corrupted. So you're in this really difficult position where you can either try and build a system that supports unlinkability, try and build a system that doesn't allow a third actor to figure out how someone's voting, to figure out someone's political opinions, or you can build a system that doesn't allow for corruption. 
So death to the minorities or corruption for the majorities. That's the choice right now. And uh, actually, this uh, choice isn't just about liquid feedback or liquid democracy, but any electronic voting system. And generally, the, the problem is that uh, you cannot both verify that everybody uh, they voted only once, and um, that they voted for uh, for what they, uh, was actually counted in their uh, in their vote, uh, while still maintaining anonymity. In fact, it's not even possible to do it on paper. The only reason why we kind of accept it on paper is that uh, it is Byzantine enough, it is uh, complicated enough that, practically speaking, it uh, it kind of works out. Uh, there are examples of voter fraud, and those voter fraud examples come from the fact that they're trying to build a, a, a paper-based system which has verifiability and unlinkability, and frankly, it's just not possible so far. There might be a solution, and the, that comes from a mathematical thing, and this is why we all love crypto, uh, that uh, there's been a lot of uh, examples recently with uh, append-only data structures, where, um, where instead of maintaining um, uh, some kind of list of, of votes as one usually did, um, then you create a, a list of cryptographic hashes which refer backwards in time, and anybody who has access to the data structure can, can prove uh, each point. So there seems to be some kind of possibility there, and one of the issues is that uh, append on data structures, they've been around a long time, but nobody's really spent a lot of time categorizing them, figuring out how they work yet. So that's kind of something that's new and possible. But uh, if we talk a bit more about Concepts like liquid feedback. Um, uh, this is, you know, one of the things. Uh, this is maybe a bit my fault uh, for uh, not being explicit enough a couple of years ago. But uh, liquid feedback uh, as a system, it is really obscure. It's written in an obscure language. It's undocumented, uh, mostly. Uh, what documentation exists is in the form of comments in German in the source code, uh, and it is incredibly hard to use, even for those who have been given explicit training. Um, now, this is kind of bad enough as it stands, but then you have a digital democracy divide that kind of comes on top of it. Um, and that, that comes from the fact that when you're using a digital-only system, anybody who doesn't have access to the internet or doesn't have access to computers or doesn't know how to use them is more or less excluded. They don't get to participate. On top of that, we have the, the problem that comes up in any democratic system and has kind of been uh, pushed aside economically by the uh, existence of, um, uh, of representatives over the years, but the dictatorship of free cycles, which is basically that uh, people who have time to solve problems are normally not people who have real problems. Whereas the people who have real problems are too busy trying to solve their problems to actually be able to solve them generally, and therefore you have uh, a lot of weird stuff. And that comes down to a fundamental bandwidth limitation. We have lots and lots of people, but we don't, each individual person doesn't have a lot of time. And whether they choose to use their hours after work on, say, uh, clicking through some kind of vote system or delegating their votes to people or trying to write a new law proposal or just kind of hang out with their family or maybe go on vacation. You know, most people kind of choose the latter because it is kind of more fun. And that's, that, that's okay. Uh, we just have to acknowledge that there are bandwidth limitations and we need to try and de design systems around them. One of the other problems is that liquid democracy being a system which basically favors people who can show up and write well. Um, we confuse written fluency with having new ideas or having good ideas. It turns out that there's actually very little relationship between the two. Um, but when you have a system that is based on, OK, you show up and you write something, and can you persuade people with the power of your writing, that doesn't necessarily actually map to whether or not the ideas that you're proposing are any good at all. Certainly not whether or not they're good for the people who, with whom you're, you're persuading. So, um, but on, a, on another level, I mean, technical issues aside, one of the problems that uh, the, uh, applies to liquid feedback and, and also to other direct uh, or participatory democracy systems that we've seen pop up over the couple, last couple of years is that they generally try to solve a process problem without there being any encoded understanding of how these actual processes work in reality. And uh, normally this comes from a certain kind of technological purism standpoint that you know, somebody can sit down and graph out 
the, the exact parameters of how a perfect democracy might actually work. And then you add people into the mix and suddenly everything breaks down. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is fair, but uh, you know, the, the thing that any such system needs to be able to do is to take the existing systems. About, For instance, when we do meetings, we normally go by Robert's Rules of Order. I have not yet seen any meeting management system that actually understands Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, again, you know, with, with democracy systems, par parliaments everywhere in the world have uh, uh, rules of procedure. These are kind of uh, built up over, over a long time and normally encapsulate a kind of pretty good way of making things work when you have lots of people who are kind of paid to disagree with each other. And, uh, if we manage to capture these processes as they are in the software, then we're definitely going to be uh, get, going in the right direction. Another problem that kind of comes up is that politics is not about getting people together to identify problems or debate about problems. It is fundamentally about getting people to make decisions. And most of the software that we've seen so far actually doesn't really know much about, uh, well, doesn't really capture very well what decisions have been made and how that institutionalization of the ideas that have been de decided upon by a polity are actually going to be carried forward into the future. So one of the, one of the real problems that this, this basically boils down to, <sighs> geeks like math problems. Geeks really like math problems. We're really fond of saying, hey, this is a human. Hey, let's make a math problem. Let's totally solve the math problem. You know, we build systems which are not actually trying to solve the problems that we have. You know, we have a human problem about how we decide on resource allocation, and we convert it into a proof of arrows theorem of undecidability of voting structures. This is not where we need to be going, people. <laughs> But uh, then, again, there's all, all, all sorts of other human-created fallacies or problems in this kind of system. One of them is that, uh, you, know, you know that guy in the parliament who keeps wasting everybody's bandwidth by introducing the same proposal every year? And everybody throws it out, but it, needs to take, it takes up a bit of time in the process, and, and kind of people are a bit annoyed by it. Mostly, this is a denial-of-service attack on democracy. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, at the same time, sometimes this has been used in a beneficial way. William Wilberforce in, in the late, uh, early 1800s uh, managed to slowly erode the concept of, of uh, that slave trading was fine in England by proposing every single year for seven years that, uh, that slave trade be abolished. Eventually, uh, slave trade was abolished by a completely different method and had nothing to do with it. But, you know, it was a kind of uh, uh, Overton window shifting process that kind of had to happen. And so at the same time, we could either design a system that would make this kind of uh, denial of service attack impossible, therefore precluding this kind of activity, or we accept the fact that maybe sometimes there's a reason for it. So we've been talking a certain amount so far about the structure of decision <coughs> systems. I want to shift out a little bit more to talk about the politics that we implement with those decision systems. Um, the information politics movement, which is the pirate parties and a lot of other kind of related things, it's probably a lot of people here who do activism, really needs to not end up as another Green Party. Um, you know, the Green Parties basically said, hey, we care about sustainability, that's awesome. Oh, there's all this other stuff. We'll be sustainability plus social democracy. Yeah. Um, we need to actually take a look at the principles that we care about and say, okay, let's start from zero. Let's build out a complete politics. Let's actually have a vision of the world that we want to live in, which isn't just you know, today and our existing standard of living without all this nasty privacy and censorship stuff, right? You know, we care about privacy and censorship and copyright, but most people don't. You know, this is not a majority opinion. Just like with green politics, that's gonna mean that unless we manage to figure out how to make information politics matter, how to pitch it in the grand scheme of things, things like privacy and censorship and copyright are gonna stop being about let's, let's restructure society so we're doing the right thing, and are gonna start being about, well, let's just maintain the status quo because it's totally fine that we have all these big companies and they own the internet and all that. Let's just try and get them to stop doing this little thing, you know? And the fact that there are children starving in the street everywhere, well, you know, that's 
that's just tough luck. So one of the things which information politics tells us, one of the things that this, this change in structures informs us about the world is that we have agency that we get to actually go out there and do things and change things. You know, we don't have to wait to, for the existing structures to give us permission to act. When we break down an institution, there's, there are two things that happen in an institution. There is the process that that institution happens to take to implement whatever it's doing, and then there's the substance of the actual work. When we break down an institution into something that looks more like a network, we distinguish between those two. We can go do the substance, and the process can be changed for whatever actually matters. You know, this is the, okay, let's just go do the thing in the way that works. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that this brings up is that we don't get to do this in a vacuum. We still have to interact with some of those institutions. Hurricane Sandy in New York was a really interesting example of this. Um, right after the hurricane came through, in fact, you know, while, the, while the wind was still blowing and the rain was still coming down, a bunch of the folks from the local occupations got together and said, well, you know what? We know how to mobilize. We're just going to go start serving some food because it's the right thing to do. And you know, within, I think it was something like within 24 hours, they'd served 20,000 hot meals. Um, it took the Red Cross weeks to show up. Now, one of the problems was that the Red Cross and you know, the National Guard and the Federal Emergency Management Agency and New York Police Department and all these other folks don't really know how to deal with a network. They have no idea what that thing is, how you interact with it. Um, one of the most interesting things which did happen during the, uh, during the Occup whole Occupy Sandy um, kind of timeline was it was at least one instance where uh, the, the Sandy folks were like, okay, well, let's, let's hold a town meeting. Let's do this thing that we normally do when we have you know, a bunch of people from different groups that need to interact. So they held a general assembly. And you know, NYPD and FEMA and everybody else had to get on stack to talk you know, because they were kind of running the show. That's really interesting. That's kind of a pivotal moment in the engagement between these things. But one of the critical roles, one of the things that made that actually work, was there were a bunch of people sitting in the middle being translators between the institutional mindset that you get in places like FEMA or DOD. Um, DOD is a really interesting example. Any, any disaster in the US, they provide all the heavy lift capability. If you need stuff moved in, you have to deal with DOD because they're the only ones who can move the kind of cargo tonnage and the kind of time that you need. Or you have to deal with Walmart. You know, Walmart's actually a slightly easier organization to deal with, but <laughs> Walmart can do amazing things in disasters. Like, oh, I need 50,000 gallons of water. Great, tap, tap, tap. Sure, it'll be there in six hours. It's on this truck. Um, but still, you need the kind of, you know, a, a county level or, or state level emergency management officer can do that, not somebody who's actually on the ground and understands what the needs are. So uh, about two years ago now, we did a little bit of an experiment uh, while the Icelandic constitution was being rewritten. Uh, this, of course, was a kind of new thing that uh, a, a kind of uh, representative body was elected from the population and given the mandate to uh, sit down and write a new constitution. And they said, well, hey, we have the internet now. Why don't we ask people what they want? And this was kind of cool. And we thought, well, OK, one thing we really don't want is for uh, the legal code that will be the foundational structure of the Icelandic state for the next umpteen years uh, will be riddled with uh, remote execution bugs and, and stuff that will basically break the system. So we thought, OK, let's, let's sit down and do some linguistic analysis on the text as it is coming out and do some uh, Boolean structure analysis and do kind of the kind of analysis that we normally do on software. Just seriously, just uh, debug it. And we sent ideas in. And in one way, what we were doing was we were taking lots of kind of networked functions and pouring them into this thing which we called CAST, the Constitutional Analysis Support Team, which was an institutional intermediary that just kind of, it, it was the thing that allowed us to speak to the, uh, the uh, Constitutional Assembly in a language that they understood. So there is, all of us have organizations like that. And 
One uh, kind of sticking to the uh, to the weirdness of Icelandic politics for a moment. Uh, our mayor, when when he uh, mayor of Reykjavik, when he took uh, power um, a couple of years ago, he claimed before the election that when they took power, they would not uh, form a coalition with any political party, the members of which had not watched The Wire. And at first, it was kind of like, okay, this guy's a comedian, maybe he's just joking with this. But then you watch The Wire and you go like, wait, what is The Wire about? And on a broad scale, as a TV show, it's basically about agency. It's about what people can actually do within a system. So when you're the mayor of a, uh, of a city or a prime minister of a country or a citizen in your home, you know, the, there are limitations to what you can actually achieve. And if we take the union of what each and every one of us can achieve, that defines the, the realm of what is possible within the state. So when, a lot of what we're trying to do on our day-to-day -day basis is try to figure out the structure of our available agency and how to navigate through it. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. You, you all do this on a daily basis. but. Somehow, we haven't really captured any methods for actually tweaking this and expanding agency yet. <clears throat> so there comes this crazy idea of protocolization, where um, in society, we have lots of explicit power structures, and we have lots of implicit power structures. And sometimes the implicit ones are kind of uh, undermining the explicit ones and vice versa. But we have this nice thing in complexity theory and, and formal languages that it basically says that every, uh, every automata, every, every machine of any description is equivalent to some kind of language. And this is pretty cool when we realize that things like the central bank and the tax office are actually just institutions which take inputs and give outputs. They are machines, they are automata. And what does that mean for us? Well, that means that we can actually figure out what kind of language they're speaking. And once we've done that, we can replace those institutions with peer-to-peer -peer communications protocols. Right? You can't actually do this to every organization or every institution because some of them actually have a much deeper role. And there's uh, one of the cool things about complexity theory is that we have complexity. Some institutions might actually be regular languages. Some might be context-free. But you know, when we have Turing machine uh, organizations, we're probably not going to replace them with, with anything except a weird uh, communications protocol. And it'll probably break down pretty quickly. So what do we do in the meantime? So <clears throat> one, of the, one of the issues with protocolization it can do a lot, but there are, there are limits to what we can do because there are things that are in institutions which aren't just like, oh, we go through and we execute these business rules in order and an output comes out. Um, the process of protocolization is very useful because it says, okay, instead of having this explicit big institution that is the control structure for society, we get to evolve and emerge a control structure that we all can, that we all have some kind of agency to interact with, to patch, to change over time, because there isn't this separate institutional entity that is, um, that exists to keep itself alive. You know, the first thing that a nation state cares about doing is the is, is not the survival and safety and well-being of its inhabitants, it's the continuity of the nation state. You know, this is why there's this distinction between what we think about as what national security should be and what nation states seem to think national security is, which is about them, not us. Um, but the problem with just doing the shift entirely to protocols, even though it gives us control, is that it misses institutional memory. It misses the things that an institution knows because there is continuity of the <clears throat> actors involved. Um, uh, do we cover network no. memory here? Or? Uh, just cover it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there, are, there are all of these things that, that uh, you know, oh, how do we actually make this process work? You know, I have, to, I have to send this form here, but I know it'll actually time out, so it actually needs to go by this alternate route. You know, some of this stuff is just bugs that can be encoded, but some of it is also, well, how do I... Um, you know, how do I frame this specific interaction? How do I talk to so-and-so? How do I make this work? You know, how do we actually keep things moving? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you might have seen this picture of, uh, or the story about the, the monkeys and the ladder and the banana up on top of the ladder. 
And in that example, basically, every time a monkey goes up to fetch the banana, water is sprayed over all of the other monkeys. And over time, the, the monkeys decide that any time anybody tries to go up the ladder, they just beat him up. So the researchers who, uh, according to the story, I haven't actually seen whether it's, it's a true one or not, but it's a good example. Uh, they slowly replaced some of the monkeys with monkeys who had never actually been through the water process. And they, of course, tried to go up the, the ladder and, and got beaten up. And, and so they just learned that going up the ladder is a bad idea without actually knowing the repercussions. And then over time, suddenly, you, well, you get to the point where there's no monkeys who have ever been exposed to the water threat. But the water threat still exists, in theory, right? But that doesn't matter, because every time somebody tries to climb up the ladder, they get beaten up. So the threat never comes to be. And putting this into a human context, well, this is the same thing as happens with humans inoculations and megadeths in the sense that we used to have this situation where uh, people died in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of diseases that we now know how to cure. And explicitly, we have made these inoculations. We, we've started to disseminate them, and, and you know, uh, people are largely immune to these diseases now because of, uh, of the inoculations. But the tacit memory of why people, the, the memory of the megadeaths or, uh, or kilodeaths that were occurring uh, is gone. So as a result of not having taken care and managed that tacit knowledge, we have a generation of people who are growing up being inoculated or choosing not to be because they think that, well, the, the threat that, that is being exposed to us, well, it isn't actually as much of a threat as the uh, solution to it. So tacit knowledge kind of has a lot of value in that kind of sense. So. One of the really interesting things that institutions can do that networks can't do is remember over long periods of time. So a network is basically a collection of nodes executing some protocol in a moment, right? If you're on the internet and you suddenly stop passing packets, you're no longer on the internet. You're not part of the network anymore. Um, if you think about the tax office as a collection of nodes which are passing packets, um, how does the tax office realize over time that, hey, something's gone wrong here. We need to change the shape of the protocol that we're running because you know, too many people are accumulating too much money and our wealth redistribution function is broken. Um, if you don't have some kind of reflective function, some kind of memory function, you, you just break large chunks of things. Um, one of the really good examples of this is how, you know, how a duocracy, how a, how a system that kind of exists in the moment and where anybody can just go ahead and do whatever they want, you know, this kind of this world of agency that we're talking about, how does it decide to not do something? So it's really easy for, and I'm, I'm going to pick on Anonymous as an example, right? How does Anonymous decide to not kill someone? Um, it's very easy for Anonymous not to decide to kill someone. You know, positive future Anonymous that runs around with AK-47s. Um, you know, it's very easy for them to not decide to kill someone, right? They're just like, well, you know, it doesn't get enough critical mass, whatever. Nobody really cares. But if everybody's like, yeah, this is a really interesting idea. I want to think about it. And any one person can pull the trigger. How do they all collectively decide we're not going to do this? So. You need some kind of institutional function. You need some separate function that can say, hey, remember, guys? Remember when you all decided that you weren't going to do this? And, in, and that institution doesn't necessarily have any enforcement power. That institution isn't necessarily the thing that stops anyone from doing anything. That can still be within the protocol of the network. The institution is just the thing that reminds people. Right now, institutions are very inefficient protocol execution systems that have long-term memory. Right? They have a lot of overhead when they're executing protocols, when they're running processes. A lot of that is about maintaining long-term memory, and a lot of it's about you know, maintaining their own integrity and their own power base. So what if we get rid of all the process execution stuff that exists in institutions right now, but keep the long-term memory? What if we build institutional structures that are sort of the complement of the network, instead of trying to do all the things that the network does badly, 
plus this other stuff that only they can do. Um, the IETF is a really interesting example for this. The IETF is not an institution that executes anything on the internet. The IETF does not route packets. Um, what the IETF does is it serves as a point of memory for, hey, this works, this doesn't work, this is broken, we need to fix this, this is the long-term process, this is the standardization of this protocol. It is an institution filling a long-term but non-executive role in a purely networked context. So uh, kind of the, the weird bringing this back into real everyday politics example of this is what do we do about environmentalism? Right? Uh, we, a lot of people recognize that there's a problem with the environment now, but the, the institutional role hasn't really been fulfilled because uh, people are a bit afraid of it. And uh, at the same time, the network has no ability to stop polluting. There's no, no enforcement mechanism. So in, in thinking about this, we, we decided that there's a few kind of open problems that need to be addressed if we're going to make network politics in any way meaningful. Uh, and by any way meaningful, I mean uh, get it out of this kind of uh, point where we're stuck saying, well, yeah, uh, you know, we, we really don't like uh, you know, people violating our privacy and, and enforcing intellectual monopoly rights on us. But, you know, we also care about health care and, and education and all these other things. So the first one is just mapping the complexity classes and exe executive processes of institution. This is where we figure out whether the tax office is an NP-complete system or not. And uh, figuring out the executive process is just sitting down and making a diagram. Uh, pe people have been doing this uh, at the Open Knowledge Foundation for how copyright actually works. But copyright's kind of uh, pretty straightforward. Let's do it for how a school works or how, how an insurance system works. Uh, or central bank, right? The uh, second thing is we need to figure out how we actually describe these in a protocolized way to each other. So how do we uh, write the protocols? How do we uh, set the, the conversations in motion? And then we need to solve a very interesting problem with regard to an, uh, anonymous cryptocurrencies. Everybody kind of you know, thinks that Bitcoin might be a good idea or it might not be a good idea or there's flaws in this implementation, but none of that actually matters because if everybody were to start using Bitcoin in Hamburg today, then suddenly Hamburg's ability to tax people disappears. And that really means the downfall of any welfare systems or road maintenance or anything else that we societally care about. And as a result, we, we need to figure out either how are we going to do this in a collectivized mutualist way, or how are we going to uh, build collectivized taxation systems that, uh, that are, are capable of compelling people to, uh, to participate in this, in this social function. Uh, and until somebody figures that out, we should just consider things like Bitcoin to be harmful, even if they are uh, trying to achieve goals that we more or less agree with, right? The fourth thing is that we need to figure out better tools for network institution interaction. So uh, figure out how we get institutions to understand what networks are saying and vice versa. Um, basically, we need a translation layer that doesn't have to be in the form of something like the Constitutional Analysis Support Team or a bunch of volunteers at a uh, Occupy Sandy meeting. We, we need to figure out that translation. And then network jurisprudence. Uh, first off, how do we enforce laws and how do we decide not to enforce laws in a networked environment? Do we just uh, accept that everything is Wild West and bounty hunters are okay? Or do we decide, well, no, we, we need to accept that there are limitations to where we're actually going to take uh, uh, actions against people who violate our, our protocols and our social contracts. And maybe in some cases we decide, well, maybe you know, this human uh, being a human, we shouldn't treat this as a computer program. There's lots of uh, reason for mercy. So we've come a long way really, really quickly. You know, if you look at where, um, you know, where all of the, these ideas around non-representational democracy and stuff were 10 years ago, the answer is pretty obvious. They weren't anywhere, or they were you know, just starting to be a kernel in a few people's heads. We've built some really interesting systems. Um, 
we're being faced with some much, much, much larger challenges, though. We have a very, very long way to go, and we need to grow up very, very fast. We do not have the luxury of time. We do not have the luxury of delay. We do not have the luxury of fucking around solving philosoph philosophical problems that don't have any real-world impact. Unless those, you know, there are philosophical problems that we need to solve, but they need to actually be directed towards the real world. And one of the things that is really pushing this seriousness is the fact that if we look at where network politics is today, we have uh, within the pirate parties there's about 172 elected officials worldwide, well, all, all in Europe, right? Uh, the idea of organisations, whether it's uh, you know IATF or uh, well, you know the, them being subverted by something like the uh, Internet Governance Forum and so on. There's there's all these different things that are kind of bringing network politics into the forefront. And the more information technology becomes the the core of our everyday lives, the the ideological influence of what is the network is growing. But as a result, uh, we're har hitting harder and harder walls. People who really, really do not want us to win are becoming more and more serious about preventing us from doing so. And if we don't figure out the solutions really quickly and figure out how to protocolize things and also figure out the deployment pathway for those protocolizations and more or less just figure out how we're going to deal with things such as tacit knowledge and explicit authority and implicit authority in a sensible networked environment, then there is the chance that the blowback from us trying to do this now in our kind of slow meandering pace is going to be so hard that we get knocked on our asses and we have a digital dark age. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, go to the microphone and please, if you ask a question, um, we're not terribly interested who you are, why you're here, how grateful you are, just ask your question brief and shortly, otherwise we'll cut you off. So. Um, the gentleman on the left first. Hi. First, thanks for the great talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my question, or it's rather, um, yeah, I think you put a somehow misfortunate example of Bitcoin. Um, if we all decide to only do our payments in Bitcoin right now, I think it doesn't change anything and whether... How do you pay for roads? How do you stop someone who has a lot of money from saying, oh, I'm only going to pay a little bit for roads. Everybody else will yeah, pick up the yeah, stack. Yeah, so let, let me get to the point. Uh, like, it's still my own decision whether I pay taxes or evade taxes. No. It, it's just I the, have the, the only diff practical difference is the semantics of about how taxes are enforced. No. Because we could also pay like taxes in Bitcoin. Oh, no, but the, the fact is that the state has lots of mechanisms for knowing how much you are earning. The, the, the tax enforcement system basically forces everybody to comply with this idea of socialized taxation at pain of going to prison. And when you have anonymous transactions that uh, basically there's no really sensible way to show how much you actually own and how much you actually got, then suddenly the ability to enforce that in a practical way just disappears. And we but, want to keep the anonymity functions. We don't want to throw those out. Yeah. So we need a way to prove how much you earn and make you pay taxes on that without actually revealing the information. I'm just wondering about how is it different than now when I'm paying in cash? Because in Germany, it's pretty usual that you pay things in cash. I go to a coffee shop and pay in cash, and still they pay taxes. So there's sure. the difference. If they pay in Bitcoin, they could uh, pay taxes as well. And so even if they accept some uh, foreign uh, it, currency it's, like it's US dollars. It's true to an extent, but it falls down very quickly. Because if yeah. the government notices that you don't pay taxes for a certain amount of time, then they will come and ask you why. And uh, for example, for a coffee shop, they'll say, well, OK. <coughs> 
you know, you don't seem like you're keeping adequate records, so we're going to estimate based on how much, say, your milk supply or how much milk they claim they sold you, and we'll just assume based on your prices that you made this much money and you owe this much tax. And it's up for you to prove to us that you don't owe this much tax or we'll throw you in jail. So that's, that's where you lose all of the anonymity of the transactions because you're eventually forced to reveal everything. Now, if we want to keep the anonymity, we need to provide structures that let people have privacy and anonymity of transactions even though they're electronic, but allow for not necessarily the state, but infrastructural collect, geographically bounded infrastructural collectives to compel people to pay taxes. Yeah, but, but if it, that is even Shall easier, we move on to the next question? Like yeah, you can talk about this later. Yes. <laughs> Gentleman on the right. Hi. Um, I'd like to put to you a criticism that was made by Adam Curtis about the Occupy movement. And what he said was that really um, the similar sort of problem that you described around institutions seeking to defend their own power base and integrity, <coughs> networks do a similar sort of thing. And what he was saying was that people in the Occupy movement weren't arguing about um, how to go about bringing around global equality. They were arguing about who was the most anarchic. And um, really, uh, that within networks, there, really, there is this um, sort of so individual. Is, is, I'd like to ask Adam Curtis if he ever spent a night in a camp. Oh, he did. He did. Oh, no, well, is this the same Adam Curtis as claimed that Ayn Rand invented the internet? Um, I'm, I'm not quite <laughs> sure that's what no, he was saying. No, well, but, 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 was... Okay, the, the, the point is, yes, okay, there are problems with the structure of Occupy, sure. But, uh, We're not proposing that as a model for the future. No, no, not at all. It's a very interesting example of some of these types of structure playing out in the real world. It has, like, the, the, the whole General Assembly thing, yeah, fuck the GA. Like, seriously, <laughs> this is not a model that we want to build on, but it's a model that tells us a lot of things. No. <laughs> uh, read the very first point about uh, incomplete politics is useless. I can see how this applies to political parties. For example, the German Pirate Party has a still ongoing argument about whether to extend their program to uh, non-net politics topics. But uh, as it sounded in the talk, uh, this all this. Uh, shines a bad light on political movements on a small scale, like, for example, the transparency law in Hamburg. This is a very concentrated political affair, and when I want to do a transparency law, I don't sit down and create my big political vision of social security systems. Absolutely. Sure. So the issue there is not necessarily about your political party or your group of, of political activists focusing on every issue. Sure, if your interest is privacy, then having an, a, an agriculture platform doesn't really make a lot of sense. But on the other hand, you need to have a sufficiently complete philosophical understanding of, of uh, why your ideas make sense and how they are coherent and how they encompass things such as agriculture. Otherwise, your privacy arguments are going to fall flat. I see a lot of what, what you're proposing is that the value Sorry. and potential of networks and how we can rethink democracy and institutions. However, I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things, one of which is in his conceptualization of, the net, of networks, Manuel Castells also outlines different types of power. And these power includes the power of, uh, to control information and participants on the networks, the ability to define the normative standards or essentially the protocols of a network, the power of one node over another, as well as a power to build networks. So I'm wondering, with the reality that when you have a network of different nodes, the relationship between nodes will still have a coercive power. What are you proposing to disrupt the current concentrations of capital and power that are the most, pro uh, really the central problems of today's attempts at democracy? So I think the best way to deal with situations like that is not, I mean, look, the traditional answer from the left is, well, let's have a revolution and then purge everybody with any money. Um, that hasn't really worked out so well for the 20th century. So maybe instead what we do is we build alternate structures and you know, we just kind of say, OK, well, we're just going to go build this thing over here. And yeah, it's a much better way to run things. And it can just sort of infect into the world. And then eventually, you know, hopefully in 10 or 20 years, everybody sort of looks up and says, oh, we still have nation states. That's so cute. So this is kind of the. <laughs> 
This is, uh, this is kind of the point where Buckminster Fuller runs into Thomas Gresham. It's, uh, you know, you don't uh, uh, like just throw out the existing reality, you actually build something instead of it. And then you have a competition between the ideas and the better one will probably be pushed off the market by the worse one. <laughs> By the way, can we cut down on the academic quotations in the questions and keep them brief? Uh, next question, you over there. Uh, hi, a small comment. Um, uh, I would just like to, to say that uh, I think that the networks you're talking about also can function and do function as institutions. For example, Anonymous does have a, in my opinion, pretty firm set of rules, of principles of working, set of sanctions. So basically, I think that these That's networks also develop institutional memories and possible bad sides of institutions as well. Um, the, that, the set of things that Anonymous has is a protocol and a culture. Mm -hmm. A protocol and a culture is not actually the same as an institution. Okay. Um, so the individual actors in the network have memories. You know, to the extent that the nodes stay the same, then, then the nodes have memories because the nodes are people. But that's not the same as the, as the entity as a whole having a memory. You know, institutions have processes where they, I mean, you know, have you ever worked at like a large corporation? You know, they have like cultural indoctrination processes, mm -hmm. literally. They don't necessarily call them that. Sometimes <laughs> they do, um, if they're feeling honest. Um, and that's fine, because that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're saying, okay, we're bringing you into an institution, and we now need to impart the institutional memory to you. And you have knowledge management processes over time, where it's like, okay, you know, internal knowledge base, whatever, you know, okay, you're the new director of so-and-so. The old director of so-and-so is going to work with you for six months so that you don't lose any of the tacit knowledge, right? Whereas the node replacement in the network is, you know, hey, I got bored or I got arrested, so I'm done. And then somebody else steps up. No transfer of tacit knowledge. Okay, but don't you think that the networks with time can become institutions? For example, Anonymous in 10 years, if it still exists, I hope it does. I think if so, it becomes an institution, then it loses everything that's good about it as a network. Well, <laughs> okay, so next I, question. Yeah. Well, uh, just to add to that, you have to like, make a distinction between explicit institutions and implicit institutions. So the, the thing that makes the thing an institution is its tacicity. Tacicity, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, ability, its ability to retain tacit knowledge. So anything that can do that, even if it's implicit, is fine. Okay, next question. Yes, uh, I'm just wondering if you have uh, any thoughts or proposals for how to deal with personal files in the sense of, um, if you look at a citizen, every citizen is basically, for, uh, in, in, the, um, um, in the view of the state, is a bunch of files, or so files held in different institutions. Is there any discussion on where this file is going to move or how they are handled? And are there any sort of protocols or ideas um, um, how to organize this, uh, uh, these entities? You're asking a very hard question. Um, basically, the individual should control all of his knowledge or all of his information himself. How we actually do that in a realistic uh, way is uh, an unsolved problem. Actually, that might actually be something we should add to the list. But on the other hand, uh, you are slightly wrong because the state does not just see an individual as a bunch of files. It also sees them as a potential tax revenue source. Uh -huh. which, which probably is the same thing. But <laughs> am I understanding that right? Um, yeah. Is it me? Okay. Oh. Sorry. Uh, but the vision I got from, from this would be that you basically render every individual uh, into something that carries its virtual file cabinet on its back. Is that basically the idea? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. This is an unsolved problem. I, I, I would really like to have the solution to that. Uh, if anybody has it, please give it to me. Answer but, fuzzy. Ask again later. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question. Um, you, you used the word called implicit and I liked it very much because I personally see a perfect servant for me is someone who serves me without asking too many questions what I like and he preempts my wishes actually. And uh, in this organization building of communities, uh, you mentioned the Occupy movement, there's much 
focus on process of redesigning a process of making decisions of collective decision making. But in reality, I think democracy is more about how to bring uh, the state in line with me as a citizen and uh, use whatever tools for, for that possible. So how do you see this fetish of uh, decision making and uh, we as a group and uh, organization building? The, the liquid democracy model is really good. Uh, the thing that it needs is, well, first off, we need to solve the anonymity problem. So putting effort into the uh, uh, figuring out how to have an anonymity or unlinkability and verifiability simultaneously is really kind of fucking important. But then we also need to figure out, like, how do we work? You know, how do we decide things? If we decide that we're going to go have a beer, what is the actual process from uh, us you know, coming together and us deciding that? That process needs to be mapped out and uh, actually made pretty explicit. Decisions are often implicit in our personal relationships, but when you have a group of 10,000 people deciding whether they want to uh, put a highway through a village, you kind of need things to be rather explicit. And, you know, liquid feedback or liquid democracy as a concept is definitely the right way to do that in a non-representative way. We just need to fix the bugs. And one of the things I think um, right now we're looking at very, very early versions of systems that are still, um, still really clumsy. You know? And uh, you know, I think the, the first parliamentary democracy, I mean, I don't know how, uh, I wonder how clumsy it felt at, at uh, Thingiveller. You know, when yeah. they had the first parliamentary meetings, you know, we're, we are comparing very, very new systems with no cultural currency, no pastness of tradition against systems that have hundreds or, or you know, maybe a thousand years of, of kind of history and smoothing over all the rough edges and are kind of really like built into the culture the way we think about decisions. You know, the new systems will get easier. A lot of what they need is polishing and bug fixing, and then they also just need time. They need time to become things that feel human. Uh, let's remember that liquid democracy as a concept started as a blog post eight year, well, uh, no, uh, 2008. That's how new it is. Like, it was a crazy blog post, and you know, now it's organizing political parties. That's a long way for a crazy blog post to go in five years. But or four years actually, I do. Yeah, but um, you know. Okay, shall we move to the next question? Yeah, a couple of thousand years will help. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin, hi. Um, I love the complexity analysis uh, process. Thank you very Thanks. much. Um, you, you didn't. Sorry, 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 <laughs> Walter. Uh, you, you didn't. You didn't uh, explicitly mention the fact that human beings are most of the time um, dominated or trying to dominate people, uh, like Laboury or Francaise, and um, how this point, which is for me crucially important, uh, could yes. be uh, managed in your complexity and your, your process. Right. So I actually, we le uh, left intentionally all of the crunchy, beautiful math stuff out of that. Uh, but uh, you're right, there are definitely some sociological issues that need to be addressed as well. Um, we also chose to leave them out because you know, that would be a talk of its own. Um, I mean, uh, politics is kind of war by other means, and a lot of what a system like this is designed is to ensure that no one wins, you know, and, and to, to keep the actual fighting down to as low of a level as possible so that we can actually just get the productive stuff done, right? You know, you cannot necessarily remove the fact that people are going to try to find advantage over others, you know, and I mean, you can, you can mitigate it culturally. But you know, at some level, there's going to be that kind of competition. But you can build a system that tries to say, well, let's, let's not encourage people to fight. You know, let's, let's encourage cooperation whenever possible, and even while acknowledging that we have to explicitly prevent. Another thing is we, um, we normally talk about uh, uh, we normally talk about the fact that uh, you know, societies are all this, uh, this endless competition, but uh, and that's kind of this weird social Darwinism that we decided was okay. But if we actually go through the, the literature and talk about where where these ideas of endless competition and the war of all against all, you know, as, as Hobbes put it, uh, came from, it's it's more or less just. Um, it, it, it's not true. It doesn't work like that. 
societies are massive collaboratories. They, you know, we collaborate a lot. We, we survive through mutual aid and mutual suffrage. So helping each other out kind of, you know, it does happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't be coming to things like this. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, so the thing about all these social structures that we're talking about is that they're all based on trust between human beings. That's, that's the most basic rule. And if you want to talk about it in the world of mathematics, that means that you have to have some sort of axiom that you base your, you know, all your work upon. So uh, the existing social structures actually have some pretty good they're not, you know, they're not perfect, but some pretty good ideas of how to deal with issues of trust between people, about people that, ref that want to go against the, the structure of society. How do you see those ideas working in a network as opposed to as how they work today in centralized institutions? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, trust. We, we talk about trust all the time. You know, crypto is basically a method of uh, conceptualizing and managing trust to a very large degree. And frankly, humans have not really become very good at that. That's one of the kind of shortcomings of our evolutionary process to date is, you know, we kind of have very weird, vague feelings about how we trust each other, but we don't know what they're about. We're really good at understanding trust when it's on the scale of people we can punch. And once it gets beyond, like, you're close enough that I can see you, and you're like one of, you know, maybe a couple hundred people, we still think we understand trust, because all of the same kind of machinery works in our head, <coughs> but it's not actually hooked up to anything. If we look at, like, networks. We talk about networks all the time, but if we look at the evolution of human language, it has never been developed with the kind of conceptual vocabulary to actually talk about networks. The only networks we had 200 years ago were, were, were any, only descriptions we did of networks 200 years ago was describing how we were related to each other and, and why, for that reason, we shouldn't be uh, copulating. You know, the, the, you know, that, that was the extent of our network topology discourse. discourse. So. Hi. So. Uh, I hope I'm not going to mix apples and oranges with what I want to ask, but um, so intuitively, I just feel like law or policy is only as good as the power behind it to to the influence, the actual raw power there is to to implement and the thing. Course. So, if uh, if your network decides to no longer comply with, for example, United States' desires to have a certain kind of copyright law in your country, all of a sudden you're faced with a huge network of countries who are, even if neutral on the topic, somehow obliged to comply with uh, something against your, your interests. So without, how do you create raw power to actually implement the decisions your networks take? So that's the question. That's not really something we can sit down and come up with. Like, there's no way of, of saying the authority will be here. Well, the best we can do is try to codify our will and try to explain our will to each other and try to you know, understand collectively what we want and then take that and put it into some kind of vessel of us enforcing it. And of course, you know, for, uh, most countries have laws that are several hundred years old. Uh, the, the oldest law in effect in, uh, in Iceland is currently from 1263, if I recall correctly. And the enforcement of that law just is fairly... Uh, Lacks, right? It is law. It's equal to every other law. But nobody just cares, right? So people caring about things and people actually having will and ingraining that will and enforcing that will is what makes a polity work. So yes, and then there are the, the uh, barbarians from without who also sometimes exert power over us. Not a lot we can do about that except maybe raise an army and burn down a village. I mean, I think... I think one of the things there is basically saying, well, let's go build systems in practice on stuff that doesn't get us beaten up and get enough of a power base there that when we do finally decide to make a decision that annoys people, they can't really do anything about it. Thank you so much, and it's so cool. I finally get to ask a question myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> shut up. Um, you, you mentioned tested knowledge and the preservation of tested knowledge in organization. And isn't religion actually a wonderful mechanism for that? For example, in Middle Eastern religions found out that keeping pigs around was not good for erosions. So you didn't, didn't, you didn't you, get to eat pork. Didn't you just uh, forbid academic references? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that rule doesn't apply to myself. So no, there, there's no citation there. I just made this up. Yes, religion is an example of one of the kinds of tacit knowledge. That's tacit knowledge on a longer time scale, though. There's a kind of a there's tacit knowledge about processes and there's tacit knowledge about the world. Religion is tacit knowledge about the world in a long time period. The tacit knowledge that we're more interested in is tacit knowledge about the institution and the function of the institution. So if why the function of the institution is to be the human digestive system, then, then you know, kosher law is totally relevant. But if, it's the, if it, the function of the institution is to be the tax code, then it's less relevant. But uh, religion is a really good example of this happening in a certain sense because it is exactly the example of uh, all of the monkeys having been replaced. So you know, all of the explicit knowledge is gone. So all of the reasoning behind why, why these weird laws were codified in the first place is gone. And what we have left is a weird mythos with no, uh, well, with a kind of a strangely uh, misanthropic institution that's trying to enforce it. Um, okay, thank you. We can do better. Um, we had, have five minutes over time left, and per request of Ella, Queen Northern gets to make some comments as well. So it is, we're kind of running an anarchy here. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'm a, a, a journalist, and um, uh, to, to give you some context for why I'm up here, and I work a lot with, uh, with Ella, and specifically I study a lot of these stochastic movements like Occupy and Anonymous, and I'm working on the Arab revolutions at the moment. And um, I was, you know, I was kind of bouncing around in my seat during a lot of a lot of different things. And one of the things I actually wanted to kind of add to this real quick is that surprisingly little of the process of creating these sorts of things is new. Um, this better not count as an academic citation, but if you read de Tocqueville, um, Democracy in America, there's this incredibly powerful feeling that comes up that we've all had to invent this before. That when these structures were first postulated, they didn't have any way of speaking traditional power. And that went well in America because there wasn't traditional power and that turned into the French Revolution in France, um, which was bad. Um, just throw that out there. Um, but, uh, but you know, it, there's this moment where you realize somebody had to invent the ballot box and somebody had to invent a way of moving ballot boxes around and somebody had to invent a protocol for how this crap was going to work, like on a very physical level. Somebody had to invent physical democracy 250, 200 years ago. Um, and we have that so baked into us at this point that we forgot that this had to be, somebody had to sharpen the first stick on these social processes um, and invent the wheel. And we don't realize that that's not just built into human nature at this point. And, and so we're back in that state where we're kind of like coming up with these, with these um, institutions and they're incomplete. And I mean institutions in a different way, I'm sorry. Um, um, this, this kind of like body of tacit knowledge and cultural knowledge uh, that doesn't speak to traditional power. Like in the case of, uh, there's this fascinating case with t the Tunisia post-revolution where the Tunisian revolution threw out the government um, and then a new government came in that was basically made of things that weren't really, you know, the Salafis and, and um, the Ben Ali supporters, not really representative of why people hit the street in Tunisia to overthrow the government. And all that government knows for sure is that the people can throw it out. It doesn't really understand what the people want. And that kind of, um, the structure that emerged in Tunisia and throughout the government doesn't have a way of speaking to the government at this point. There's this kind of like detente where they know each other is dangerous but don't speak the same language. Um, and that's kind of, even where these structures are successful, they're not successful because there's no dialogue of culture going on yet. And a lot of that, I think, comes back to building that tacit set of knowledge. And I think this is and very the possible. There. Uh, the, the the translation. translation. Well, so part of the problem though, with translation is the people speaking the language don't know what they're saying a lot of the time. It's a yes. very, very new language. So it needs to be translated yeah. to themselves. Sure. But another thing there is we really need to avoid um, building the explicit structures that we do decide upon 
to be so rigid that we end up with uh, 200 years from now uh, something that to the future version of ourselves will seem as stupid and w weird to us as the, uh, uh, say, the American Electoral College does to us today. Oh, come on. I'll have to do this all again. <laughs> Maybe. Like, but, we're just going to make new problems for another generation. You know, the goal is not to have no problems for the new generation. It's just to give them easier problems and better tools. Or more interesting <laughs> problems. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you leave, please take your trash with you. Well, if you leave your laptop around, I'll take it. And please do not forget to volunteer as an angel. Thank you. <laughs>